the welcome and also the introduction and also make a few remarks. But just to remind us why we're here, and I'll start off by observing all protocol and then I'll make the introductions um, of our special guests who are here with us today. And the Nobel in Africa, of course, is a STS initiative in partnership with Stellenbosch University under the auspices of the Nobel Foundation and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences with funding from the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. So we are really privileged as a university to be partners on this initiative, and we are really grateful to our chancellor for hosting this symposium. So just starting off with the first uh, who come on stage, and I'm going to have uh, to ask um, just Edwin Cameron to join us. But before then, I just want to make a small introduction. Um, uh, just to say that Justice Edwin Cameron is widely recognized, of course, for his brilliance and his commitment to human rights and social justice and is considered to be one of South Africa's most prominent and dis distinguished judicial uh, figures in the country. As, as an alumnus, of course, of Stellenbosch University and a recipient of an honorary doctorate from this institution, um, he was recognized for his, of course, and stinting professional and, and personal advocacy for the recognition of every person's dignity, freedom, and equality. And he's our 15th chancellor, I think, since the establishment of the university. So I'm really privileged to ask him to come um, up. The reason why we started a few minutes late is because, as you know, he's a very good networker. He doesn't leave the crowd once he sees people. So we struggled to get him to this stage. So, but thank you so much. I, I just want to welcome you and then thank you. I, I ask you to come and make a few remarks, opening remarks. Thank you very much. That is the most elegant rebuke I've ever received. <laughs> My joy is to be here and to, in the post of Chancellor, be the nominal host of this lecture. You're going to hear about our extremely distinguished people who are going to give the lecture. I want to say just two things. We're proud of many things, and rightly. We're proud of Stias. We are proud of Stellenbosch, which is a jewel at the heart of South Africa's academic and intellectual firm firmament. We're proud, after 30 rough, tough years of being a functioning democracy, but some things we're also ashamed of. We're ashamed of governmental dysfunction, of corruption, and pertinently to what will follow now, we are ashamed of poverty remediable poverty, poverty that we have had 30 years to do more about. We've done some things, some things that we're proud of, but we haven't done enough. 
and our two distinguished lecturers this evening, who you'll have properly introduced in a moment, are here because they are internationally laureated, awarded, garlanded, because their theories address remedies for poverty. That is why we rejoice in being here together this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for those opening remarks. And then also we have amongst us um, our, 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 our observe all protocols with your permission. I see a lot of uh, distinguished people in the crowd, so, and also I think the members of the rectorate who are present. But I want to take this opportunity to introduce our vice chancellor and rector. Me at the back? Or is that better now? Yes. So I want to introduce our Vice Chancellor and Rector, Professor Vim de Villiers. Um, so Professor Vim de Villiers, uh, you can stand up and stand the way the, way, way the Chancellor was standing, sort of. <laughs> I think he faced that way, yeah. So Professor Vim de Villiers has been the Rector and Vice Chancellor of Stellenbosch University since 2015. When he joined, of course, um, he, he had spent a lot of time abroad, uh, I think over two decades um, uh, in the U.S. and other uh, European countries. So after graduating from Stellenbosch University with an MBCHB, he went to Oxford University for his Ph.D. And then, um, of course, to, um, to America, where he studied at Harvard and held several senior positions at the University of Kentucky, including being the head of gastroenterology, which he likes talking about. I think now you can make some jokes <laughs> on behalf of Ingrid. She'll be very happy. And, um, yeah. and, and then he, he also during that time was the administrative head of the Good uh, Samaritan Hospital. He was included, of course, in the publication of the best doctors in America. He, he was then appointed, of course, as dean of health sciences at the University of Cape Town in July 2013 and returned to South Africa before joining SU in his current position. On the national stage, of course, he serves as the chairperson of the Finance Investment Committee of University of South Africa, and is the chair of higher health, and serves, of course, on a number of international bodies. Um, he's known as our main fundraiser at the university, and I think uh, we can boast as one of the universities that has a very big portfolio in terms of donor funding, uh, which helps to support students. And I think during this time when we talk about poverty and some of the challenges of higher education and access to higher education, we are really privileged to have um, a vice chancellor and rector like uh, Professor Davidius. So can I ask you to make a few remarks? Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Moya. So you can clearly see both the Chancellor and myself, we know our place. Um, so friends, colleagues, and, and members of the public, um, over the past two years, the Nobel in Africa Symposium Series has showcased the knowledge production and research potential here on our continent. So to put this in context, Africa has the youngest and the fastest growing population in the world. According to the UN, more than half of global population growth between now and 2050 is expected to occur in Africa. The population of sub-Saharan Africa is projected to double by 2050. So with statistics like these, intellectual investment in our continent makes a lot of sense. Now as you know and as you've experienced today, through the Nobel in Africa initiative, STIAS became the very first institution outside Scandinavia to host a Nobel Symposium series on behalf of the Nobel Foundation since these symposia were initiated in 1965. Last year, this event also included an outreach element that saw participants deliver a public lecture or public lectures. And like the one we're attending this evening, and this is a an excellent way of taking science to a wider audience. So I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Sibusisu Moyo and her office for their dedication and commitment in organizing tonight's lecture. And tonight we'll be guided by the wisdom of Nobel laureates Professor Esther 
Duflo and Professor Abhijit Banerjee. It's really an honor to have such distinguished minds grace our symposium, sharing their insights and experiences. So let us strive to harness this knowledge for the betterment of humanity, particularly for the advancement of Africa and its people. And may tonight's lecture inspire us to chart new frontiers and create a future of prosperity and opportunity for all. And no gastroenterology jokes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ingrid Wurrard. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, and it's my enormous privilege to be introducing to you this evening our two guest speakers, Professor Abhijit Banerjee and Professor Esther Dufro. Esther Dufro was born in Paris. Her father was a professor of mathematics. Her mother was a pediatrician who worked all over the world treating children that had been victims of civil war. So from a ver very early age, Esther developed a strong social awareness of the fact that a person's life chances are fundamentally shaped by where they are born, the lottery of where they were born. And she developed a strong desire to, do, to, do, um, to pursue a career in which she could make a real difference to the world, which she has certainly done. So she studied, uh, Esther studied history and economics in France um, before making her way to MIT, where she did a PhD, ending, um, which she completed in 1999. Those of you that are familiar with um, the South African literature, which is most of you in the room, I think, um, will, will know about her grandparents, uh, grandmother's and granddaughter's paper. Uh, and that, what you might not know, was actually part of her, of her PhD at MIT all that time back in, in 1999. So after completing her studies, she elected to remain at MIT um, and is today the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics. In 2010, she won the Clark Medal for being the, uh, for the best economist under the age of 40. And of course, in 2019, was one of the winners of the, no the Nobel Prize in Economics. Only the second woman to win the, to win the prize. Um, Happily, with, the, with Claudia Golden's win in 2023, we, we would hope that the, the time interval between female winners is, 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 is shortening, um, but time, time will tell on that front. Abhijit Banerjee was born in Mumbai. He then moved to Kolkata for his, for his schooling. Both of his parents were professors of economics, um, which inevitably leads, sorry Abhijit, to jokes about uh, uh, some degree of occupational immobility between generations. Um, <laughs> He did a PhD at Harvard and then went on to tenure track positions at both Harvard and Princeton before moving to MIT where he has remained and is currently in the position of the Ford Foundation International Professor of Economics. In 2003, Esther and, and Abhijit together with their longtime collaborator Sindil uh, Mulanathan established the Poverty Action Lab at, at MIT which was then to become, uh, went on to become the Abdul Latif Jamil uh, Poverty Action Lab, JPL for short. Uh, thank you, thanks to a generous uh, donation from, uh, from one of the MIT alum alumni. JPL is anchored by a network of more than 900 researchers across the world, and they conduct randomized impact evaluations and seek to promote a culture of evidence-informed policy making, with the overarching goal of transforming how the world approaches the pressing challenges of global poverty. In 2019, Professors Dufro, Banerjee, and Michael Kramer won the Nobel Prize in Economics for this experimental approach to alleviating global poverty. Through the award, the Nobel Committee recognized both the significance of development economics in the world today and the innovative approach of these three economists and their broader network of collaborators. They have introduced a new approach to obtaining reliable answers about the best way to fight poverty. It involves dividing the issue into smaller, more manageable questions. Since the mid-90s, they've been able to test a range of interventions in different areas using these field experiments. For example, for improving educational outcomes or child health. 
So tonight, Esther Dufro and Abhijit Banerjee will talk about their 2011 book, Poor Economics, in which they weave a coherent narrative of how poor people actually live their lives, of the constraints that keep them poor, and of the sm these small incremental policy changes that can together alleviate poverty. One of the book's central themes is the importance of understanding the poor as rational decision makers, constrained by personal circumstances. By unraveling the complexities of poverty dynamics, they advocate for context-specific interventions. Moreover, poor economics highlighted the efficacy of randomized controlled trials in evaluating the impact of social programs and policy interventions. I think it says a great deal about Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo that tonight they didn't just choose to give an update on what they've learned since poor economics was published in 2011. Instead, they chose to talk about what did they get right, what did they get wrong, and what did they miss altogether. I think that speaks to true intellectual curiosity, rigor, and humility. To quote from one of their, their later books, Good Economics, they are hard-headed about the facts Skeptical of slick answers and magic bullets, modest and honest about what they know and understand, and perhaps most importantly, willing to try ideas and solutions and be wrong, as long as it takes them towards the ultimate goal of building a more humane world. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor Esther Duflo and Professor Abhijit Banerjee. Thank you very much, Ingrid, for those very kind words, and thank you to the Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, and the entire group of people who put this together. It's really an honor to be here. I, uh, you might be mystified by the fact that Esther didn't come up, but in fact, she will. Uh, we, we, we've done this over many years. Um, I, I, we, one of us starts, the other one, and usually I waste too much of the time and Esther gets annoyed with me but doesn't say it on the stage. But <laughs> oh, um, I'll try to not do that today. Um, the, so as Ingrid said, we, in 2011 we published a book called Poor Economics. The book was written actually starting in about 2009, so it's about 15 years since we kind of started writing it. It's, a, it's the book that, um, of everything we've written, articles and books, is by far the most read of everything we, we have written. And, um, and it's, it's a, it was an attempt, as Ingrid said, to kind of tell the story behind a lot of the uh, the results we were seeing then. It's been, the, as I say, as you know, a good amount of time since then, and a time which has been extremely um, sort of, I think, uh, very, very uh, uh, successful in development economics. There's been a, it's been a field that has expanded a lot. There's been enormous amount of new and I think high quality research. Um, and a lot of those researchers are here in the room. Indeed, a lot of them will be disappointed perhaps that when, or maybe not, uh, when, that when we talk about what happened since, we'll be drawing upon their work and indeed work that they presented today. So if, if you hear some of the echoes of what you heard during the day today, it's not an accident. This, the conference was indeed uh, also reflecting 20 years of development economics, and uh, what we have to say is in many ways uh, just a subset of those things. Um, so, lim so what what do we w want to do in in this um, in this talk? Uh, I, I, in in some ways, we you know we were um, as Ingrid said, uh, it's. A, when you, when you do experiments, and the nice thing about experiments is that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you do it and it turns out you had a guess and it turns out your guess was right. Sometimes you do it, 
and it's less good. Your guess was wrong. You got, got, got it backwards. Um, sometimes you, you do an experiment and uh, you, you see, look at some of the outcomes, but there are lots of other things you forget or don't, don't think of looking at. And then someone else comes along and shows you that that was much more important than anything you thought of. And, that, and it's all of those things have happened. So we've done experiments which uh, we were, were right and continue to be, give, I think, the right answer. There were experiments that we did which were, you know, had uh, maybe a negative answer, but eventually we decided that you know, the answer is actually not what it was, not often, ba often not based on our own work, but on the ways, work of so many others who participate in this effort. And sometimes, you know, we, we are just surprised. Some, something, someone else comes and does something which we thought was either, you know, not interesting or not possible to do, and they just do it, and we find remarkable insights that we would have loved to have had, but didn't. So it's all of that that we tried to, we, we, in thinking about what to, what to do about this book that is now quite dated, uh, we thought that it's rather than changing the content of the book, which, uh, which would be, um, I think, difficult given that it was written in a particular way at a particular time, we thought that the easier thing to do would be to uh, write a, a, a long, uh, forward for a second edition. And what, what this is, is a summary of that forward. Uh, we're trying to give you some ideas from that forward, the for, and, and uh, some of that will, uh, will be, uh, you know, will be uh, sort of work that we've done, a lot of the work will be what others have done, but I think in, in some ways our, the, our view of the world has become richer and, and denser and and more sophisticated since then, and it's it's actually, and since most of it's not because of what we did, it's a delight to be able to report on it. It's also a world that's different, and it's a world that's different in many different ways. There's a lot more uh, RCTs, uh, randomized control trials. We were we were doing uh, randomized control trials uh, in at the in 2008-9. There was you know, there was a bunch, we were perfectly, you know, we we're proud of what we had done. Since then, if you look at that curve, uh, there's just so many more experiments, that curve keeps going up and it keeps going up, um, g going up uh, kind of exponentially. So it's, a, it's, a, it's really um, very different world evidence-wide. In terms of what, what, um, the impact of the work, you know, more and more results have come in, more results have been used, more results have been used to change policy, and with those uh, kind of growing bubbles are evidence of, you know, we have a particular and relatively conservative way of estimating how many people's lives have been influenced by policies that we have, uh, the we meaning, the big we of j the 900 researchers have together, have put to uh, have, uh, well, the policies that those 900 researchers have helped to change, and that number gets now to be, you know, over 600 million. So that's, the world has also changed. Uh, the world has changed in many ways for the better. Uh, there are more, more people who are no longer poor, or uh, the extreme people in extreme poverty has fallen sharply since, since has been falling since for a while, and since, 2009 has fallen sharply. That's what that graphic shows. But, but also, uh, you know, there, there is, um, you know, other outcomes. Child mortality has fallen. Um, you know, uh, you know, ma many things have have changed. But also, they, I think uh, there have been a number of, uh, you know, rather frightening moments. Uh, COVID-19 being the, perhaps the most important of those. There have been, and I think. What, what is on looming on our, all of us is climate change. And in some ways it's uh, what, what, we are, um, what we are about to uh, launch, uh, you know, what we are kind of taking on now is uh, therefore a world which is 
both richer but also more frightened of, especially of climate change, where maybe dire poverty is less of an issue, but health, health emergencies might be more of an issue. And so the thinking has also changed for the right reason, which is that it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a somewhat di different world. What I want to do is take three topics, and Esther will take three, and then she'll conclude, um, and talk briefly, very briefly, walk you through what, what we've learned on each of these. The first is edu education. Edu education is, a, is something that we were very much, uh, you, a lot of the earlier cities, the randomized control trials, were in education, so it wasn't, so we had actually a significant amount to write about in poor economics. And I think the main point we made there <clears throat> was uh, that a, a lot, while there are many things that education experts will su suggest and education departments will take on, many types of innovations, they'll change buildings, they'll change textbooks, they'll introduce computers, M most of those do very little to improve uh, educational outcomes. What seems to be the biggest uh, driver of change is teaching what the, ch the children in ways that are directly, um, you know, that, that address their strengths, their, their insights, their, what they know, um, what, what is sort of very broadly called teaching at the right level. Um, and that was the conclusion in poor economics uh, that essentially the, the fact that the curricula are often uh, not adjusted, nor is the teaching adjusted to where the children are, that the children, it's not because the children can't learn, but what they're taught is often not what they are able to learn at that point of time, and that the system rarely adjusts for that. And that was uh, to us, that, that's what we emphasize in poor economics. I think the evidence from the last many years has been um, very positive to that view. So I start with something where we were right. I don't, you'll see that we're not always right, but it was, this was one place we were right. We were uh, more, we, had, um, we see that in the world, this, this is, measurement has improved. We see that this is a problem, that children are in school, but they're, the buildings are there, the, the, the books are there, but they're not learning, and the, the teachers are there. And that's, that's, that's often a result of this fact that uh, the teaching is very much uh, inclined to focus, focus on, on, uh, not on covering the curriculum rather than teaching, teaching what the children need to know. This, there's now a, we within, so pedagogy has been, I think, at the heart of a lot of, lot of the, uh, the evidence, teaching at the right level, other ways of getting teachers to pay attention to what the children need to learn. There's a group of interventional constructed pedagogy. The, the, these ten turn out to be the, there's a, a, there's a report that just came out, which is called the, the GEAP, horrible acronym report, um, uh, and uh, I, I am, I'm partly responsible since I chaired that group, so <laughs> it's, it's still horrible. Uh, the, so that uh, un, unspeakable report, uh, is, uh, one of the things it says is that, you know, the things, a lot of the things that are uh, work are very much fixing pedagogy and or <clears throat> encouraging parents to be more more the uh, education of young children, getting getting parents to be more or for very young children, parents to be more involved in their in in engaging with intellectually with their children. Uh, that's but it's really very much in that space rather than in the space of uh, access to schools has always been another. Uh, when you don't have a school, you don't learn. Doesn't mean when you get a school, you do learn a lot but you still learn more. And so that's all, these, these have been what was found. This was a review of, I think, many thousand, 16,000 uh, different studies and 400 uh, 
studies were eventually looked at in detail, and out of that, what emerges is very clear. It's pedagogy that's the most important element. That <clears throat> the, the evidence since, maybe I'm going to have to speed up. Uh, Ingrid, how long do you, do you have total? Another 40 minutes? Okay, then, then I'm, I'm not going to panic yet. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, so I, I think that one of the things that um, so this has meant is that there's now um, a, a set of, um, there's an organization which we set up called uh, TARL, Teaching at the Right Level Africa, which is working in a number of countries, you can see the graphic, where, where they're trying, we're implementing uh, working with governments to implement this idea of changing pedagogy. So that, that's been one of the places where I think we, we have had a fair amount of impact. The ideas in poor economics were right. And in a sense, what, what is maybe even more, uh, maybe both depressing and, you know, for, for, for the two of us, maybe a little bit, uh, you know, a pat on our backs, is that if you look at other evidence that's come out, for example, on, on this is a, Esther's work on uh, very young children and how they learn. And, uh, and so this, this is about preschool mathematics. Uh, they, they, are, they are taught basically pre-arithmetic, so stuff that involves comparing shapes and things like that. This increases their uh, general cognitive abilities. They are better able to understand mathematical concepts. They are uh, and yet, when, when you look at the effect of that on school outcomes, it really isn't there. So in other words, teachers, again, going back to this question of pedagogy, despite the fact that these children were much more able to understand mathematical concepts, the teaching really doesn't respond to that. The teaching essentially ignores that fact and passes it by. And that's, that's one of the things that uh, the evidence is, uh, is somewhat depressingly there. Another, another um, study that we, I'm going to skip all that, so just, is, um, is a study of, uh, I am, I'm missing one thing. Oh uh, yeah, so m one more. Um, yeah, I can't actually see. That's part of the problem. The light is in my eye, so it's a very, um, so. The one of the other things that we very consistent again with this idea that pedagogy is is a huge problem is that we ha we see children in markets and we study them and we give them you know basically we send mystery shoppers to them to see if they can do the kind of arithmetic that you have to do quickly uh, to sell. And, and all the kids in markets can do that arithmetic. If you give that same arithmetic to school kids of the same age, they are much worse at doing it. That might suggest to you that these, these market kids are really good at math. But then if you give them a math test, they do much worse than the school children. So in other words, they're really two separate. These kids have instincts of mathematics. They have trained themselves. They're very good at it. But the school system doesn't actually engage with that at all. The school system is on a parallel track. And in that parallel track, the school children do better. So in other words, there's no conversation between these two different forms of pedagogy. And that's, con again, consistent with, with this view that the core problem is pedagogy. I'm going to. So there's there's there's, um, there's more work in education, and I could con go continue, but I'm, I'm going to run out of time. So let me talk about health. In health, um, I think one of the things that uh, we were very much engaged with was this idea that uh, you know uh, that vac vaccines, for example, are a very you know, cheap and effective way of pre preventing death and disease. And, and while a lot of the work we, early work we had done and in the chapter in poor economics was about these kinds of things, like vaccines, like other, other like using uh, 
insecticide treated bed nets, things that protect lives at low cost but require some decision making by the family. So not, in other words, they were, they were preventive health interventions of different kinds, which contrast, we contrasted with the more, um, more uh, curative. So when, you, when you're acutely sick, you go to, lots of people go to the doctor, they get medicines, sometimes the right medicine, sometimes the wrong medicine, there's a lot large literature on that as well. We've worked on that a little bit. But when, they, when preventative um, interventions are very different because they require being forward looking. Uh, thinking now it's not needed, but in the future it's going to be valuable. And in those interventions, the main insight that we emphasize in poor economics is that it, there was a consistent pattern there, which is that people under uh, the demand for that is often very sensitive to the price. So whenever the price goes up, even a little bit, people don't want them. And that in reverse, if you give them a small incentive, they're more likely to get them. So that 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 fact was was at the heart of the chapter and indeed uh, that that's the this is the evidence that when prices go up it, it goes down um, it's all the incentives we we had argued then matter and the evidence is again reassuring uh, there were newer studies in Pakistan and Nigeria, and indeed we did one more study, and in all of them we find that incentives matter. Incentives is particular incentives that uh, reward completing the set of immunizations matter. So that's, that, that, that was reassuring. In this nice work by Anne Caring, suggesting that even some bracelets that mark that you have done it uh, give people incentives. So just a plus, uh, a silicone bracelet worth almost nothing gives people a reason to get their children immunized. So that, that's a, that, that's, a, now why, why is it that it needs these incentives? After all, these are, these are things that will save your children's lives. Why do, why do you need, need an incentive when it's, it's your children's life that's, that's a, at stake? And I think part of the answer, and I think this is where the new research stuff that we didn't understand and we had not, and indeed didn't, it's not our research, it's research by, mostly by others, um, uh, most, most of it, is, is that there is a sense in which people, people are, um, <clears throat> are suspicious of the health system. One, one evidence of that is that uh, even though we, even when health practitioners know uh, what to do, they often will shy away from doing all of it because people seem to be uh, ir suspicious of, if you ask them to do something expensive, they're suspicious of it. And in general, there's, I think, lots of evidence that pe people um, who have experienced any kind of, you know, uh, have any reason to be suspicious of the health system are much less likely to use, use, use the health system I'm going to skip a lot of this. Um, this was, of course, true in the, in the US, but there's a very nice study, for example, in French colonial Africa, um, where uh, people were often for, uh, treated or mistreated for, for, for uh, um, sorry, I should be able to see this, M mistreated for sleeping sickness, um, uh, in, and when you look at those people who had been exposed to that mistreatment for longer, they're m less likely to, to get, get immunized today. So the areas where this happened, where w people have a very long memory of the health system coming and abusing them. So the lack of trust is a result often of policies that were pursued with perhaps good intention, but certainly with very bad implementation. So that's a... Um, and uh, to, 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 along those lines, how do we restore trust? That seems to be a, a, the, one of the great issues because it's clear that within the healthcare system, unless people really take the initiative to prevent, take the preventive steps, it's very hard for the health system to deliver the results. And that's one of the places where we, we, had, we had kind of suggested that 
this was an issue, that people were not getting the treatments. But I think what the later literature has done very effectively is shown that uh, the reason, and the reason is, comes mostly from other people's work, uh, showing and thinking deeply about this issue and showing that, in fact, the reason is the lack of trust. Um, the last uh, topic I want to talk about is, uh, is uh, entrepreneurship and credit. These are intimately linked. Uh, um, Muhammad Yunus was given the Nobel Peace Prize for the idea of microcredit, which was the idea that small loans are going to generate large benefits by encouraging uh, people to start lots of new businesses. We, 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 and then, and then, you know, there was a blowback on that. People, people were claiming that this was actually not a good thing. Mostly, uh, there was not much of a uh, rigorous evaluation till some later. Eventually, we did a randomized controlled trial, um, and there's uh, Dean Cullen, who's in the audience somewhere, did one in the Philippines. And beginning with that, there was a long series of randomized uh, controlled trials showing that uh, access to, uh, to microcredit is, does not transform people's lives. People don't get richer, but they also don't get, they don't fall into debt traps, they don't get poorer, they just have, do what you would imagine, which is they use the credit to buy uh, refrigerators or televisions or whatever they want to buy. That doesn't make them richer, but they make them happier. This was, this was a perfectly reasonable place to, to land, um, and that's, that, there was a, there's sort of a nice body of work showing that this is quite robust across many countries. This is, this is, the, that this is the right conclusion. What I think, what we had missed, uh, and we missed partly because it was, we had too little data. When we went back to these people and surveyed them later, and this was, uh, so we had kind of been dismissive of the idea entirely that you know, that microcredit will, uh, or access to credit will generate, um, at least access to small amounts of credit will generate large gains in entrepreneurship. What we had missed, uh, and it turns out we were wrong. It, it turns out that when we went back to these people, it, uh, we and looked at more carefully at a more long-term data, we could see that there were people who really benefited from access to credit. Who were these people? People who had businesses before they, they got access to microcredit. Those people, we, we call, sometimes call them gung-ho entrepreneurs in work with Emily Breza, who's somewhere here, and Cynthia Kinnan, um, uh, that these people are much more likely to actually use the credit and uh, expand their businesses. And when you look at the effects on those people, it's actually really large. So in other words, which is very significant, because it means that the access to credit actually, they, they, might, they are now hiring more people. So they, they, instead of thinking that everybody's going to set up a business and everybody's going to, and either, uh, and everybody's going to a little bit richer, what happens is that some of these people actually benefit a lot and they eventually start hiring other people. So that's a very different perspective. It's a perspective that emphasizes heterogeneity in, in the outcomes. And one of the things that, that we, um, we uh, therefore, um, um, sorry, to go back to one, uh, this, yeah. This slide. Uh, what we learn, for, sort of, is that there must there must be that people are very different. The question is, can you do something about it? Can you use that fact? And the answer turns out interestingly, yes. So I'll finish by. So this is where I think just the new work is is exciting. It's much further ahead than where we were. So there's a paper by Husam, Rigal, and Roth. Um, were all at the Harvard Business School. They, what they do is they, they take on this idea that there must be heterogeneity. And in, but the question is, how do you find out who's, who's, who's a good businessman, who will benefit from this loan? So basically, they went to, to the, the community and asked people, can you name who are the people who are going to be uh, the best businessmen. And they did something slightly more sophisticated to make sure that people don't just don't say, no, I'm the best. 
So, uh, which they attempted to, but turns out you can get around that. And when you take the people they predict to be the best entrepreneurs, uh, so they, what they do is, and then they take the data and they split the people who are in the bottom third in terms of other people's prediction, this guy is useless, then people who are in the middle and the people who are great, okay? They divide in th three groups. And then what they do is they say, okay, uh, within each group they randomize and give uh, ha half of them $100 uh, a grant. And why do they give $100 grant? They see wh what they do with this $100 and does that increase the, the profitability of the business. The, for the people who are predicted to be not very good, probably people like me, the answer is they get 0% return on that $100. They really don't gain benefit. The people who are in the middle get about 10 to 15% return per month. That's a stunning return. And the people who are in the top third get 30% per month. That's an extraordinary return. So in other words, there is actually a great deal of entrepreneurial talent. We're just not doing a very good job of channeling credit to the, the people who, are, who, have the, uh, who have the real talent. And that's, so that, that's an insight that when we, where we were looking at it, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, we were thinking, our thought was, you know, these people, we don't seem to see any evidence that access to credit changes anything. Now we know that if we could direct the credit to the right people, it would change something. It cha we were at some fundamental level wrong on that point. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Esther. I can see the, the light issue. <laughs> Um, so, uh, to summarize, uh, Abhijit's uh, kind of uh, re-review re of three of the topics that of, uh, of poor economics, uh, we did pretty well on education in the sense that the following uh, research, you know, these thousands of studies kind of, or hundreds of studies kind of went back to, to the place we had left it. Uh, in health, maybe we had uh, identified at least one thing that was uh, correct, but uh, we didn't have an explanation for it. Uh, in credit, we, uh, we got fooled by the mean uh, in saying if there is no average effect, then uh, maybe there is no effect for anyone, but that wasn't uh, correct. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is what we missed altogether, uh, what we didn't even talk about that we should have been uh, talking about, uh, or that in retrospect, it sounds we should have been talking about. Uh, the first one is, is social protection. Uh, uh, and, uh, the, um, uh, and, and related to that, the, the labor markets and, uh, and multiplier effect. So in a, in a sense, it's not so surprising that we weren't talking much about social protection uh, per se, because it wasn't really a thing, uh, or maybe we were reflecting the fact that it wasn't really a, a, a thing. And it has really increased the number of, of countries that have uh, a social protection program in the form of uh, transfer to, to households uh, has really increased since then. So if you can see, for example, here in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, unconditional cash transfer has, has doubled in number since uh, to the, from between uh, 2010 and 2014. Uh, unconditional cash transfer uh, all over low-income countries have gone up from 24 to 64. So like a huge, uh, since the, this moment where we were writing poor economics, there have been a huge increase in the acceptability of social protection uh, programs in the poor countries. They were already there in rich countries, uh, but they were abs uh, much more absent in the poor countries. In uh, poor economics, the only thing we really talked about as far as po social protection was concerned was uh, the ultra-poor programs, so I'm not going to spend much uh, time talking about them. Uh, we showed uh, the, the effects we had then. Uh, what I want to talk about briefly now is uh, what, what came up, what we totally left out, which is like, social transfers for, for everyone else, uh, the non-ultra-poor. Uh, and the, key, the three key questions that people have talked about for the design of social transfer uh, since then, 
the research that has come up since then. And by the way, I apologize for anybody who was in the room today because there is a lot of repetition. Uh, this is not obviously this is in some sense that's a good thing. It's like we are not we are not rowing in the opposite direction from the rest of the field. Uh, um, so uh, this summary will sound familiar in a way. The three key questions for social transfer that, uh, that are important for policy and that conveniently research has also addressed are issues of targeting, uh, condition, and uh, nature, uh, cash or kind. Uh, of course, the most kind of the, 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 the poster child of social, uh, of social cash transfer is universal basic income, which has no targeting, no condition, and uh, provides cash or, 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 um, or uh, equivalent of, of cash. Uh, so one of the way to ask uh, uh, the questions of whether uh, UB, uh, universal basic income UBI are, are good programs to have and in what countries and in what conditions, in a sense, is answering uh, those three questions. So there is re interesting research on all of these questions, uh, on targeting uh, what are the research questions that we need to answer in order, to, or some of the research questions that we need to answer in order to know uh, whether or not you would like to have targeting uh, uh, on the basis of people's characteristics versus going for a universal transfer or at least universal based on some geography? And the question is, is there good uh, information for targeting and at what cost? And at what cost to whom? Cost to the government, cost to the people, uh, cost in terms of potential mistargeting and missing people. Then to answer the questions of conditions is you would want to ask yourself whether uh, uh, you uh, cash transfer discourage work or uh, uh, encourages work, or, and you also would want to know whether cash transfer creates displacement effects uh, or whether it's the opposite, whether uh, cash transfers, for example, increases prices a lot or, uh, and makes life uh, difficult for everybody else, or on the contrary, has positive general equilibrium effect that creates a multiplier. And then for the third question, whether you want to have conditions um, or whether you would prefer to give cash, uh, there is the questions of whether beneficiary would waste the money and then what's the, or they, whether they would uh, use it well, and then what's the administrative cost and leakage uh, that exists uh, in this in in-kind in transfers. And basically, uh, the, 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 all of those questions of design are not going to be black and white questions. They are going to presumably depend on context and situations where they are going to represent trade-offs uh, between uh, all of these dimensions. Very briefly, just exemplars of research in, in, in all of these areas. This is really uh, just to uh, kind of signpost some ideas. Uh, in terms of targeting, one example of uh, transfers to, uh, of the cost of targeting for beneficiaries, this is uh, from work on a, um, a widow's program uh, in, in India. Uh, by someone who was then uh, a PhD student at the Kennedy School who went and kind of uh, investigated this uh, and showed that, you know, it takes two visits to an MLA to obtain your, uh, to obtain your widow's pension. Uh, so the huge personal cost in, in doing that, which of course leads to a considerable number of people who are not even trying. And one of the things that documents in this work is that even when you make people aware of the existence of the program, uh, many of them don't even try because they think that it's never going to work out. And those who try kind of pop out along the way as the cost, as the, they find the cost uh, uh, too, too difficult to, to bear. Um, an alternative uh, is to uh, uh, kind of be less, so a first alternative that I don't have a slide for is to be much more, if you want to have some targeting, is to be much more parametric, so work by uh, uh, Josh uh, uh, Blumenstock, Chris and Dean, for example, in Togo, uh, used, uh, showed how you can use uh, 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 satellite data on, if to select regions and then cell phone metadata to select people. Uh, that's much less costly once the system are up, in, up and running and they, they uh, can allow some uh, decent amount of targeting. Another thing you could do is to, uh, to uh, try to get people to self-select simply by asking them to apply. Uh, and uh, uh, in Indonesia, this work from Abhijit, Ben Olken, Rimana and others, you find that the rich are much less likely to apply than the poor. So that's good. On the other hand, just the fact to ask people to apply means that a lot of the poor don't even apply. 
even though they would qualify. So again, there is some balancing here as like, if it was, if everybody was enrolled, at least you wouldn't lose the poor. And a little bit of the debate, at least in, in policy circles that you have to fight, is that there is a lot of emphasis on errors of, of inclusion, including someone by mistake, as opposed to the errors of exclusion, which can be much, much worse. So that's kind of discussions that people are starting to, to have. Uh, in terms of cash versus food, I'll go back to the conditions later. Uh, uh, cash and food, uh, so the IFPRI run, uh, the teams are IFPRI run many concurrent uh, or almost concurrent experiments in several countries to compare a transfer of the same value to the households uh, in, given either in food or in cash and to look at their impact on food security. And what they find is that uh, the impact across countries, the impact of cash uh, on food security is at least as large everywhere else, everywhere except Niger, where finding food was very difficult. So of course, when finding food is very difficult, the government has kind of a, a comparative advantage in searching for food, and it makes sense to deliver food to people. But as long as food is available, uh, households are just spending their money. If you give them money in the form of food, they will anywhere readjust. If you give them money in the form of money, they will use some of it to buy food. But of course, the costs are much different. Uh, it's much more expensive to deliver food. So uh, giving, uh, giving cash uh, makes sense in many uh, circumstances. Another advantage of giving cash versus, uh, versus food is that uh, uh, it actually in the leakage, the leakage doesn't treat everybody the same. So in Indonesia, when they switch from uh, uh, giving, providing rice to people to providing vouchers that allowed people to buy uh, food, actually, it was kind of restricted vouchers, but in the form of voucher, not only you get less leakage, but you get less leakage that the, the leakage tend to leave the poor behind. So it is cheaper to give vouchers and it uh, gets much more of the money goes to the poor, uh, which is kind of a double advantage of that. So these are the type of, you know, just examples of the type of design questions that have gone, uh, uh, you know, the, in, in this literature. Uh, uh, very detailed, very important, very practically useful, uh, and I think that have, that have since then really, really helped uh, feeding the policy conversation because this is what policymakers need to know. Once they are interested in doing a, a, a social protection, they have many practical questions about how to organize it where uh, researchers can be, can be helpful. Then there is, of course, the question of whether cash uh, transfer would make people, or any sort of transfer would make people uh, lazy. And this is, uh, uh, so this is also something we had nothing to say, or, or we, we didn't mention at all in, uh, in poor economics, uh, but is one of, perhaps, one of the most uh, exciting uh, set of results that have come down the line. First, from all of the conditional cash transfer studies. So cash, conditional cash transfer are conditional, but they are not conditional on working. They are conditional on getting your kids immunized, sending them to school, etc. Then if you do that, you have cash in your hands. Uh, standard economic theory would tell us that people uh, would stop, would work less because of the income effect. They are less likely to starve, so they can kind of rest a little bit. And what you see in, in this, uh, basically using as, this difference, uh, comparing this difference, basically using a, a randomized control trial of conditional cash transfer program all over the world that uh, Ben Olken, Riman, and Abhijit put together, you, you don't see any difference in labor supply of the households that got or didn't get uh, the conditional cash transfer. So that's kind of a very clear evidence that there is no negative effect, no negative income effect. Uh, which since then, you know, even since this evidence, you have a number of replication of this study. And in some context, among the, the poorest uh, people, you actually get uh, uh, the opposite effect, which uh, uh, I think was, at least to me, for, uh, uh, quite unexpected, is a uh, negative income effect. So this is an experiment from Ghana that uh, Chris uh, Udry and Dean Carl and Abhijit were involved with. Uh, people got uh, one of these ultra poor programs, so they got a lot of, like, they got an asset, they are richer, they also have less time because they need to take care of their asset, which usually is a cow, so it needs to be like fed and so on. Uh, and then you, uh, you go and you offer people, either who got the assets or in the control group, another option to make money, 
uh, more gig option, so they can, uh, they can stitch this, these bags. Um, and they are paid by the piece and if, they don't, if the bag don't have too many mistakes. And what they find is that the people who uh, got the transfers, uh, who got this large uh, uh, asset transfer, despite the fact that they have more money and more stuff to do, actually earn more making bags. In particular, because they are more likely to select the more sophisticated bags and they make less uh, mistakes on them. And this echoes uh, work, for example, by Josh Dean, which finds that if you make people work when there is a lot of noise and you make them stitch uh, pockets on shirts, they're making more mistakes because the noise like deafens them up. So basically, the noise of poverty plays, uh, everything uh, looks like the noise of poverty plays a little bit the same, the same impact. So this is... Um, uh, um, Sandil Melainaten and Eldar Shafir have this book on, uh, where they, they put together, they put out for all of us to test and to play with this idea of bandwidth. And that's kind of a, a one of the evidence, and there is more that came up to, to demonstrate that. Uh, so all of this uh, kind of suggests that uh, a lot of the, 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 the thinking about, uh, about uh, um, resource transfer, I'm con purposefully not saying assets versus cash, um, uh, would potentially not, uh, have, uh, not have a, a lot of displacement effect. And in fact, uh, um, uh, experiments show that the, um, they have large multiplier effects, at least they can in, in some settings. So for example, um, uh, Ted, uh, uh, Miguel, uh, Paul Niehaus, and, and co-authors uh, looked at a study where people got a uh, $1,000 uh, cash transfer uh, in uh, villages in Kenya, and everyone in the village uh, was eligible, uh, got it, but uh, uh, the, the fraction of villages who were in the treatment group varied by uh, location. So some locations have many villages treated and some locations have very few. So you can look at the effect on the untreated villages in, uh, as a function of the concentration of village treated. And the question is whether that creates you know, extra business or whether that, 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 that takes away the business. And what you find is very large multiplier effect, that an increase in $1 in the, household, in the expenditure of the household that get the program translates uh, into $2.5 uh, in the close by villages. Uh, so that seems large maybe, but uh, uh, Cynthia uh, uh, Kinnan and Emily Breza find the same effect from using a very different experiment, which is withdrawal of microcredit. So we have this very large multiplier effect. Why are they so large? Uh, it's one of the, uh, the reasons that, and this is why this literature is really uh, uh, fantastic because everything connects to everything in very nice uh, pieces. And so we had kind of, uh, uh, this, this is uh, all, all uh, things that we didn't uh, talk about. It didn't exist yet, but we also didn't preview. Uh, the, um, uh, the reason is that, or one possible reason from work again by Emily and uh, Suprit Kaur uh, is an uh, and Yogita is that uh, there is actually a lot of slack labor in, in house, in, in villages. So when people, uh, when they, they go, what they do is they go in some village and hire up to a quarter of, 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 of people who are eligible to work, who are capable of working. And when they do that during the slack season, uh, that uh, produces no impact uh, on wages or employment of those who stay. Uh, it doesn't create a tight labor market. So at least in the slack season, there is enormous amount of people just sitting around looking, looking for work. Uh, so all of that kind of, uh, uh, maybe I'll skip the UBI study because I want to just make the last point, which is maybe this leads us to a last point, which is maybe we are thinking about labor wrong in the first place. Uh, so I started saying, well, you know, con contrary to evidence, when people are a bit richer, they don't work less. Uh, so it doesn't seem that there is a huge income effect and disutility of labor. But there is at least one study or two studies that suggest that maybe we got it backwards in the first place because actually there is, people seem to want to work. 
Uh, one study is, by, is among Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh by Reshma Hussam and, and co-authors. They, show, they basically offer the option of people to get free cash or to get less cash but to work. And people who are given the choice prefer to work than getting cash, even if they have to give up cash to work, number one. Number two, they're right to do that because when you look at them later, those who got the opportunity to, of working are healthier, have much better mental health uh, several uh, 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 weeks and months lead, later. So you might think this is a very extreme situation. But there is another study by Elisa Machi in Uganda that shows that people who are not refugees, just regular people, prefer to be given, if they have a choice between cash and work, prefer work. And also people who are in position of being benefactor, if they have a choice between giving cash or giving work, prefer to give work. So I think it's moving forward, we need to start taking these things on board because they help uh, putting a lot of the evidence uh, together on this whole new. Uh, second thing that we didn't, it's not that we didn't talk about gender. We did talk about gender in poor economics. We talked about, uh, about gender issues, about women, but <laughs> uh, we thought, oh yeah, they, are, they concern everything, so they should be aware. But in reading the book, we mostly talk about gender in the family uh, chapter, which uh, in retrospect, I feel kind of bad about because it's putting back women in the house which is precisely where they don't want to be. <laughs> uh, uh, a large number of uh, uh, women uh, would like to work, but they cannot. Uh, in India, um, um, an estimated 100 million women uh, would like to work, but cannot. Uh, this is estimated from the EHDS data set. Uh, both because of social norms, because of clash between traditional female roles and the organization of the workplace, and because they have little agency on, on the household. Uh, so there is this U-shaped relationship between income and female labor force participation with considerable variance around it, uh, in particular uh, uh, South, uh, South Asia and the Middle East uh, right down below. So what is the issue, very briefly? Uh, it's the, you know, one of the issues is that a woman's place is in the house. Um, so... Um, um, Madame, is, and it's the, the first priority of a woman should be to do uh, their, um, should be to, to be taking care of their house, feeding their kids and their mother-in-law and so on. So uh, what Maddie McElroy did is uh, she uh, uh, tried to convince uh, uh, husband and mother-in-law in Uttar Pradesh uh, to allow their, uh, their wife to work by showing them a six-minute video that attempted to per persuade them of two things. One is that it's safe. I will go back to this safety issue. And the other is that it's compatible with housework. And it, the, it worked. A lot of women uh, started, signed up for the job uh, with the authorization of their husband. But unfortunately, it was not true. It's not compatible with housework. Uh, what happened is that the women uh, uh, slept less and they had less leisure time. And nobody helped them doing their work at home. So within a few weeks, they had to drop out. So it shows that you cannot, it's not a problem, it, there is no shortcut to this problem. You cannot just convince husband that everything can be done because not everything can be done. Something has to be, something has to give. Either it's the, the norms at home or it's the work. So what can be done? Well, the first type of things you could try and do is to empower women so that they can uh, have their, uh, uh, their preference uh, their respected. Uh, uh, Erika Field, uh, uh, Rohini Pandey, and others worked uh, on that in Madhya Pradesh, showing that women who can get their uh, social welfare payments straight into their own bank account end up working more, even outside of the welfare program. Uh, so which they interpret as they have more, you know, they have more uh, uh, freedom, they, they, and since that it's their preferences, they get to, to do it. The question is whether uh, they, uh, that necessarily works. Because uh, another experiment of Madi McElway tried and it's kind of a psychological inter intervention to empower women to, and she showed that at the beginning they started working but very quickly they went back. And then when she looked cl uh, closely at the data, she found uh, something like a poverty trap in self-efficacy, which is uh, the woman who, were, who started with very low self-efficacy, you can give them an improvement but it doesn't last. The woman who started with a bit more 
if you can increase their self-efficacy, that is their sense that there are things that they can achieve, and they did that through a curriculum of kind of exercises that women did together, then they start getting some successes, and then the successes build on each other, and then eventually they, uh, they, that reinforces their own self-efficacy, and, and, the, and the effects are durable. But it shows that it's a bit uh, uh, difficult. So moving on the norms is one, trying to empower women is another one, uh, a thing you can do. The other thing you could try and do uh, is adjusting the, the job. So basically, if people will not go to the job, you can make the job come to them. And so uh, an experiment uh, by uh, Lisa Ho and uh, co-authors did that in, in Kolkata. Working with new technologies, people have a cell phone in their hand, they can uh, speak sentences in the cell phone, that's something they could do from an office or they could do from home. And so what, uh, what they did is to offer people uh, uh, various uh, options to the work. People were much, women were much more likely to accept a job if it was done from home, and they were much more likely to actually do it. And then the question is whether you take them halfway through the river and then you drop them there and they stay there forever, or whether that's a stepping stone. And in this instance, it appeared to have been a stepping stone in the sense that the women who, were, who started working because they got this option of working at home were then more likely to, uh, to accept later a job that required to go outside the house. Uh, so changing the job might be a way to move, and that's more likely to happen if women are in charge of designing the uh, So this is work by uh, Corradini, Lagacos, and Sharma that looks at that in Brazil. When women, there was a quota for women in, par, in, in union, and when new women are in, in charge in the union, they are more likely to, to have uh, uh, provisions in the union that are favorable to women, and the women are more likely to stay in the jobs uh, longer and men are not, do not quit. So that seems to be that it works for everyone. Uh, to conclude on the woman, on the gender issue, I think one of the things that really needs to be talked about is, the, is this, basically this idea that a woman's place in the house kind of m morphs into this idea of purity. And then for young women, it becomes a race between purity norms and the ability to work. A uh, very exciting work uh, currently going on in, 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 in Pakistan, where Oriana is involved, um, has the uh, ask young women who are finishing college whether they are intending to work, and they are all intending to work, and they visit them again several months later, and none of them are working. And what happened is that their husband are trying to get their, their families are trying to get them a husband. So that uh, means that this, this could be something, this is something which is different from Claudia Goldin's work from what it was in the US, uh, in, in 19th century US, where women, working women were not working, but, but uh, married women were not working, but young women ha had jobs. And today, in some countries, this purity norm seems to be kind of making that harder. Uh, so any little thing that we can pry when, when there is still time to make them, kind of give them a foot, would be critical. So there is a lot of uh, research there uh, to do. Let me conclude uh, with uh, uh, climate change. So in retrospect, that might have been the biggest uh, elephant missing in the room of poor economics. There is no chapter on climate change. In fact, there is no chapter on the environment. And to be honest, it's not even to be found really in the book. Uh, this was, we just missed that. Um, and of course, uh, it's a bit embarrassing, <laughs> given uh, the situation now. This is the uh, graph from GX showing what's happening to climate change. Uh, I'm going to show you a graph uh, first. So the first, I want to say two things. First is uh, the responsibility of climate change lies with people in rich countries, not historically, but today. Historically as well, but it doesn't matter. It's still the case today. In general, we say, well, historically it was true, but now look at the emission in China and India. True, but the emission in China and India are to produce the cars that we drive. So when you take consumption emission, it is still the case that it's in rich country that most emissions are being uh, produced, and it's in a way that's totally, totally warped. Like a 10% uh, highest emitter are responsible for 50% of the emission, and most of these people are in rich countries, and they are certainly not in Africa. Which means that 
there is actually is no trade-off, and that's really important because you see the World Bank moving into, oh, we are only going to do climate and we are forgetting about poverty. There is no trade-off between alleviating poverty and fighting climate change. Because if you manage, this is work from Bruckner, if you manage to get everyone at $2 a day, uh, you would uh, increase emission by 2%. So clearly, that's just, there's no contradiction, we need to do the two together. Uh, people are dying today for many things that have nothing to do with climate change and they need to be uh, continuing to be helped with that. However, this is a, a map that we, uh, we're soon going to a map that we saw. Uh, poor countries are in countries where it's already hot, so it's going to become hotter. And it's harder when you're poor to protect yourself from climate change. Because, so this is showing, this is like this, this thing showing basically the, the impact of one very hot day on mortality. And the, one very hot day will kill many people in Russia because they're really not used to the fact that it's hot there. But there won't be very many days. It will also kill very many people in Africa, not because, uh, not so much in South Africa, but in the, in, in, everywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa except South Africa, because people are poor. And uh, if, you're, if it's very hot in Texas, you go from your air conditioning house to your air conditioning job in your air conditioned car and you don't die. If it's very hot in Pakistan, there is no air conditioning house uh, or, or, or you have to do your job. This is a map that I think we show already five times today, but a lot of you were not in the room, that puts these two together and look at the mortality effect of temperature. And uh, along with the variability, because of course we don't know how much climate, how climate change will play out. And it shows that most of the deaths will be uh, in uh, the missile region in Africa and in, in uh, the, the north of India and, and, and Pakistan. In total, uh, the, uh, this work from uh, uh, Carlton uh, uh, et al shows that the impact would be 73 deaths for a, every 100,000 people, which is as much as all of the infectious diseases combined. This, this gives us uh, challenges for rich countries uh, because we can quickly calculate how much, basically, our consumption choices impose in cost to the rest of the world. So taking, uh, just taking the the impact on mortality, uh, multiplying by, the, by uh, the impact of climate change on mortality, multiplying by the value of a statistical life, uh, uh, they estimate that uh, the social cost of carbon just due to death is $37 uh, per ton, only in poor countries because all of the extra deaths are in poor countries. So if we multiply that by the combined emission of the US and Europe and we take consumption emission, not production emission, we get the number of $500 billion per year. So this is the damage that our consumption choices impose on the rich countries. So obviously, uh, that means it has, we have a big challenge of how do we respond to that? Do we do nothing? This is what we've done historically. Or do we do something, both about our own emission choices and also in terms of consumption? But of course, it also means that there will be challenges for poor countries. Because it's not that the rich countries are going to do really anything about that, most likely. Climate change is already with us, so the poor countries will have to adapt. Uh, we were discussing that today, that there is not as much research on adaptation as you would like. You could think of adaptation in two ways. One of them is reactive adaptation, which is a catastrophe happens, are you able to help your citizens? Uh, and so that's where, I don't need to talk about it again, but that's where social protection comes in. And one of the big thinking that needs to do is how we design social protection for a time of climate change. Um, excite, the, the work that I mentioned from uh, uh, Josh Blumentox and others on Togo shows how you can very quickly have a program that reaches people fast. Stefan Derken, our very interesting work on Bangladesh, showing you can even make it happen beforehand so that uh, basically pay people in advance of a shock to help them adjust. But all of that is, is uh, reactive, uh, reactive adaptation, where we really have so little, and that is really, we need so much more work, is proactive adaptation, which is how do we change, how uh, do people change their lives in advance so that the climate change that is 
going their way, regardless of what they do, that's not caused by them, on which they cannot do anything, um, make it uh, so that they can live in this condition. So that's if you want proactive adaptation. Uh, so great paper by, by Kelsey, uh, Kelsey Jack uh, on, uh, and Jenny Acker on uh, showing how you can, can basically regrow the desert. There are other works on, on, on hybrid uh, uh, seeds. Uh, Tevnit are an interesting work on agriculture, uh, preparing the cities that people can move. There is a range of things that we can think about. Um, uh, there is a range of knowledge we already have that we can adapt to this problem that hasn't taken place uh, yet. So even if we wrote poor economics today, we would have very little to say here. And my hope is that if we were writing in 10 years, we'll have something to say. So let me uh, 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 end by thanking you and uh, um, thanking you also very much for having us here. It's been a great pleasure and we are looking forward for uh, uh, two more days of the conference. Thank you. So thank you so much, I think, for uh, being able to explain the book in, uh, was it one hour? Just one hour, yeah, a lot of illustrations. Um, I'll not say anything to summarize anything or make remarks because I think that would dilute what you have said. But there's obviously a lot of to take away for us um, in terms of, um, I think, the experiments that you used, uh, even it was 15 years ago, and, and most of them are quite relevant today, and there's a lot we can take away as well in terms of our country. I just want to, um, so this brings us to the end, but I don't know if, uh, I know we've run out of time, unless you have a very burning question and you want to ask something, uh, you could ask maybe one question. I can take one who's very desperate to ask at this time. There is one question. Yes, Professor Yinzima? Um, you can, uh, maybe because there's no mic, you can jump to this way. Uh, or is there a mic coming down? Okay. So I'll just take one. Is there an, another burning question? So, uh, uh, my question is... Hello? Yes. yes. My question is, uh, yeah, I, I actually read your book uh, immediately after, you know, you got the Nobel Prize in 2019, and I find it's absolutely a fascinating book. And my question is that we, uh, you mentioned about a lot of countries in the books, and uh, you do a, did a lot of studies in India and also different African countries and so on. But also here in South Africa, we also have a, lo uh, a large poverty and etc. Maybe you don't see it in, in Stellenbosch, but if you go elsewhere, you see that very uh, visibly. So I wonder, you know, wh whether your conclusion etc. that you develop in the book would apply to South Africa that we can use as a practical guide to solve our, uh, solve our problems. Thank you. Uh, there is actually a lot of work in, done in South Africa on South Africa by people in, <laughs> in South Africa. So uh, uh, that's where a lot of the pertinent answers uh, come. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, it might take another hour to summarize uh, all of this work. Uh, so I don't know if you want a one line summary. Of, the, of all the resources on South Africa. I mean, the point is that it is obviously pertinent. South Africa has a lot of its own problem due to its uh, history, but uh, a lot of issues that are similar and some that are, that some that are, some that are different and a lot of uh, exciting work uh, uh, going on, so. Uh, the the uh, JPL's office is right here, uh, near here in Cape Town. And uh, one of its JPL charges to work on the country where the office is. And so there is a fair amount of work happening there. Meanwhile, one advertisement. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, Along with, uh, uh, we are about to, to launch uh, uh, Air and Water Lab with the city of Cape Town. Uh, to one of the big issues of South Africa has to do with the environment, and in particular with the fact that uh, Cape Town may, you know, as you will remember, almost run out of water. And so that's uh, that's one of the issues that uh, that uh, we are.
kind of planning to, to help a little bit. Um, thank you. Thank you both for a very um, informative and stimulating conversation. Uh, I'm very poor in economics. I teach literature, so this is not an economic question. My apologies. Um, I'm interested to know how the trials you do in various specific areas, in specific domains, in education or in climate change, how do they, what is the principle of their integration so that we can then begin to say that this genealogy of the pure, poor economics and now slightly richer poor economic model will somehow be in time, iteratively or otherwise transformative, that I want to follow this and I want to follow it across the very categories. I want to follow it horizontally, I want to follow it vertically, and I think uh, I will go back with a, a bag full of good practices and good principles. Uh, great question. It's one that we have actually discussed quite a bit uh, between us uh, during the day today. And uh, the way I think about it is uh, um, uh, like a, a pointillist painting. Uh, so um, you take one of these, uh, you know, uh, Seurat painting, and if you look at them from close, close by, they are made of dot, 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 dot. So any single of this dot is not very informative. It's not a very beautiful painting. It's just a dot. It can be a nice color, but that's, that's it. But as you accumulate the dots, you start to, uh, 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 to build uh, a, a picture. And in some areas, we have more dots, and they are closer together. So uh, you know, maybe the woman in the, in the left side of the painting start to be a little bit clear. That could be. And in some areas, it's still very sparse, and, 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 and we don't know where it's going. But I think that's kind of a. A good way to, so in other words, that's a combination of may, very many, the way Chris Udris mentioned it today, is many stories, many studies, and the stories that tie them. And, uh, and sometimes the, the, the accumulation of stories make, it, make the story more convoluted, and, and sometimes, on the contrary, the story comes uh, uh, in a kind of self-reinforcing ways. I like very much this idea of pontilism, but the thing about pontilism is that it always prescribes a certain distance from which you look at it and then it's integrated and the closer yeah. and closer. So is this back and forth, back and forth part of, your, part of your analytic methodology? That you go close, you move far. You go close, you move. And how does analytic policy... Analytic methodology is a big word, but uh, yeah, practice, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the big word. I don't have any numbers, but thank you. Uh, so just, just to, I, I was going to say exactly, uh, you know, I would not have, maybe you had better words for it, but uh, I would have said that it's exactly what we do. We built, uh, that's what we did in poor economics. In a sense, we took a bunch of studies, we wrote down a story that fitted with those. And then, of course, part of the uh, advantage of having a story is that the story has specific implications that then can be tested. And when you test them, some of them, as I were, we were saying, turn out to be true, others don't, uh, turn out to be false. And in that process, you then go back, and that's what we're doing now. You update your story, you write a, 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 maybe a more nuanced story or a, just a different story because you discovered that, in fact, the story you had had this other implication, and that implication turned out to be false, or it turned out to be true, and therefore you get, the, you are willing to hold on to your story. But that, that, that process of going back and forth between, uh, between the, uh, the evidence, the story is exactly what you said, which is stepping back and looking at all of them is building the story. And then when you go back in and you generate you think another point there, but it turns out that it's not where you thought it would be, it's somewhere else. And then you say, oh, huh, I, I, I didn't expect that, but I learned a lot when I didn't expect that. So Thank that, you. That, that's very much the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. When Professor Duflu had taken us in three short minutes through the complexities of climate change, 
the vice chancellor turned to me and said, that was very complex. <laughs> and I said to him, I'm so grateful that you said it because I was too scared to say it. <laughs> and I want to thank you because it's been a humbling and insightful experience. Uh, we're going into an election as certain of our guests are, in which the temptation is to destroy our world through ideology and through simplicity. And you have brought us a most beautiful complexity tonight. We thank you.